On February 21st, each year, the last plane leaves Antarctica's interior research stations. For the next six months, the small crews left behind will experience temperatures dropping to minus 60 degrees Celsius, months of complete darkness, and total isolation from the outside world. No rescue is possible. No evacuation can happen. If someone needs surgery, if the heating fails, if supplies run out, the crew must handle it alone until August. How do 12 to 15 people survive six months in Earth's most hostile environment? How do you maintain complex life support systems when working outside for more than minutes means death? What happens to the human mind during months of darkness with the same faces, the same walls, the same routines? This is the reality of overwinter crews at Antarctic research stations, where diesel generators become lifelines, where humans burn 5,000 calories a day just staying warm, where a June holiday called Midwinter Day becomes more important than Christmas, and where the difference between survival and catastrophe often comes down to redundant systems, careful planning, and the psychological resilience of a small group of strangers who must become a single survival unit. Antarctica's interior represents the most extreme environment humans attempt to inhabit year-round. At Russia's Vostok station, thermometers have recorded minus 89 degrees Celsius, the coldest temperature ever measured on Earth. Concordia Station, jointly operated by France and Italy, sits at 3,233 meters altitude on the polar plateau where winter averages minus 63 degrees. The danger isn't abstract. Below minus 40 degrees, frostbite sets in within minutes. One Concordia winterer discovered that wearing thin gloves outside for just a few minutes caused instant freezing of the fingers. The cold penetrates everything. Metal burns skin on contact. Breath freezes before it leaves your mouth. Opening an aircraft's gear door causes hydraulics to freeze solid immediately. Wind amplifies the lethality. A moderate breeze at minus 50 degrees creates a wind chill approaching minus 70. At these temperatures, exposed skin dies, the cells rupture, the tissue becomes necrotic. Recovery, if it happens at all, takes months. Then comes the darkness. The sun vanishes entirely at many inland stations for months at a time. At Concordia, no sun appears from mid-May through late July. It is astronomical darkness, the complete absence of natural light. The psychological impact begins immediately and compounds over time. Coastal stations like McMurdo or Palmer experience milder conditions. Winter temperatures around minus 20 to minus 30 degrees, but inland bases on the polar plateau face an entirely different reality. The altitude adds another layer of stress. At over 3,000 meters, the air contains less oxygen. Physical tasks become exhausting. Mental processing slows. Sleep becomes difficult. The body never fully adapts. These conditions make any outdoor exposure a calculated risk. Station protocols require multiple layers of specialized clothing, thermal underwear, insulating middle layers, windproof outer shells, face masks, goggles, and mittens designed for extreme cold. Even with this protection, time outside is measured in minutes. Tasks that would take an hour in normal conditions must be completed in five-minute sprints between warming breaks. Antarctic research stations are life support systems wrapped in architecture. Every design decision reflects the brutal physics of survival at temperature extremes. Concordia Station exemplifies this approach with its distinctive two-tower design. The quiet tower houses bedrooms, laboratories, and the hospital. The noisy tower contains the kitchen, dining area, gym, and mechanical workshops. An enclosed bridge connects them, allowing movement without exposure to the outside. This separation isn't arbitrary. Sleep disruption in Antarctica can trigger serious psychological problems. Isolating bedrooms from generators, ventilation systems, and social areas helps preserve the circadian rhythms that darkness already threatens. The hospital's placement in the quiet tower ensures medical procedures won't be disrupted by mechanical noise or social activity. The buildings themselves are engineering marvels. Walls contain multiple layers of insulation rated for minus 80 degrees. Windows, when they exist at all, use triple glazing with argon gas between panes. Every joint, every seam, Every potential air gap is sealed and resealed. A single breach in the building envelope could cause catastrophic heat loss. Power generation defines everything else. Diesel generators run continuously, providing electricity for lights, computers, and scientific equipment. But their most critical function is heat. 
The generators produce massive amounts of waste heat as they burn fuel. This exhaust heat gets captured and piped throughout the station, warming living spaces and work areas. Without this recycling, the fuel requirements would be impossible to meet. Water presents another engineering challenge. Some stations melt snow for fresh water, requiring enormous amounts of energy. Others, like those on the coast, use reverse osmosis to desalinate seawater. Every drop is precious. Concordia operates a gray water recycling system, treating and reusing wastewater. Showers are limited to two minutes. Laundry runs on strict schedules. Communication systems provide the only link to the outside world. Satellite dishes must be constantly cleared of ice. Bandwidth is severely limited. Concordia shares 512 kilobits per second among all residents. That's barely enough for email and basic web browsing, split between operational needs and personal use. Video calls home become precious scheduled events. The human body becomes a furnace in Antarctica, burning fuel at rates that would seem impossible in normal conditions. Winter crews consume between 3,200 and 5,000 calories per day, more than double the standard 2,000 calories needed in temperate climates. This isn't overeating, it's survival. The body burns this energy just maintaining core temperature against the relentless cold. The diet adapts to these demands. Fat becomes essential. Butter, cheese, chocolate appear at every meal. Carbohydrates provide quick energy. Pasta, rice, bread, and biscuits form the foundation of most menus. Protein from canned meats, dried fish, and legumes helps maintain muscle mass despite the metabolic stress. Fresh produce exists only in memory by midwinter. The last fresh vegetables arrive on the final summer flights in February. After that, crews rely on frozen, canned, and dehydrated supplies. Some stations attempt small hydroponic gardens, but these provide psychological benefits more than nutritional ones. A few fresh leaves of lettuce in June become a celebrated event. Meal preparation takes on outsized importance. Larger stations employ professional chefs who understand both nutrition and morale. At Concordia, the chef isn't just cooking, they're managing resources that must last six months without resupply. Every ingredient is rationed. Spoilage is catastrophic. Menu planning becomes strategic, balancing variety against supplies, celebration against conservation. Smaller stations rotate cooking duties among crew members. Everyone takes turns planning and preparing meals. This approach centers on engagement and ownership, with fairness as a benefit. The person complaining about dinner on Tuesday becomes the person responsible for dinner on Thursday. Shared responsibility builds cohesion. Water for cooking comes at high energy cost. Whether melted from snow or desalinated from seawater, every liter requires fuel to produce. Washing dishes uses minimal water. Food waste gets composted when possible, burned when necessary. Nothing can be casually discarded when the next garbage pickup is six months away. Life at an Antarctic research station operates under protocols that would seem extreme anywhere else but become essential when the nearest help is impossible to reach. The buddy system is mandatory for survival. No one moves beyond the station's flag perimeter alone. It's about having someone to drag you back inside when you collapse from cold exposure or fall into a hidden crevasse. Work schedules maintain rigid structure despite the absence of natural day-night cycles. A typical day starts at 7 o'clock a.m. with breakfast, followed by a 10-hour work shift until 5.30 p.m. The schedule doesn't care that it's been dark for two months. Maintaining circadian rhythms through artificial routines becomes essential for psychological stability. Some stations, like Concordia, set their clocks to UTC-08, aligning work hours with the few hours of twilight that pass for daytime in winter. Every crew member fills multiple roles. The electrician also cooks twice a week. The doctor maintains communication equipment. The chef assists with generator maintenance. With only 12 to 15 people at stations like Concordia, specialization is impossible. When something breaks at 2 a.m. in July, whoever is available becomes the repair crew. Movement beyond the station requires formal procedures. Sign out with your destination and expected return time. Carry a radio with backup batteries kept warm against your body. Wear the full protective ensemble regardless of how quickly you plan to return. Check in at predetermined intervals. If you don't report on schedule, search and rescue mobilizes immediately. Outdoor work happens in carefully choreographed bursts. Tasks that would take an hour in normal conditions get broken into five-minute segments. Teams work in rotation, five minutes outside, 10 minutes warming up, 
five minutes outside again. Along frequently traveled routes, small heated shelters every kilometer or two provide warming stations. Engineers have positioned these shelters based on how far someone can travel before hypothermia begins. Equipment maintenance follows similar protocols. Generators get checked every four hours around the clock. Someone is always awake, always monitoring. In winter, a failed generator can lead to death within hours as indoor temperatures plummet. Fuel levels, oil pressure, exhaust temperature, these numbers become more familiar than your own pulse rate. Medical protocols acknowledge a terrifying reality. There is no evacuation. The doctor on station must handle everything from appendicitis to broken bones to psychological crises. Medical supplies include surgical equipment, anesthetics, psychiatric medications, and detailed manuals for procedures the doctor may never have performed. In extreme cases, the doctor might have to talk someone through assisting in their own surgery. Human mind wasn't designed for months of darkness accompanied by extreme isolation and identical faces every day. Researchers have documented winter over syndrome across Antarctic stations, a predictable pattern of psychological decline that affects almost everyone who experiences an Antarctic winter. Depression increases, irritability spikes, sleep patterns fragment, cognitive performance decreases, memory becomes unreliable, the darkness does something fundamental to brain chemistry, melatonin production disrupts, serotonin levels drop, the circadian clock loses synchronization, People report vivid dreams, sometimes nightmares, that blur with waking reality. Time perception warps. A week feels like a month. A month feels like a day. Without natural light cues, the brain struggles to maintain normal patterns. Around midwinter, many crews experience what researchers call psychological hibernation. Energy levels plummet. Motivation disappears. Conversation dwindles to operational necessities. People retreat into themselves, going through the motions of daily tasks without emotional engagement. It resembles the mind's protective response to an impossible situation more than clinical depression. Privacy essentially doesn't exist. Walls are thin. Spaces are shared. Everyone knows everyone else's business. Who's not sleeping? Who's crying at night? Who's stopped showering? The lack of privacy compounds stress. There's nowhere to completely let your guard down, nowhere to fully relax. Even in your bunk, you're performing the role of stable crew member for others. Station leaders train specifically for these challenges. They watch for warning signs, withdrawal from group activities, changes in eating patterns, excessive sleep or insomnia, unusual irritability. Early intervention is critical. A crew member spiraling into severe depression or psychosis could endanger everyone, but the tools for intervention are limited. There is no option to remove someone from the situation. Coping mechanisms become survival skills. Exercise isn't just about physical fitness. It's about endorphin production and stress relief. The gym becomes a mental health facility. Running on a treadmill while staring at a blank wall for an hour seems absurd until you realize it's one of the few ways to be temporarily alone with your thoughts while moving your body. Digital connections to the outside world become lifelines and torture simultaneously. A video call home reminds you of everything you're missing while providing momentary escape. Social media shows friends living normal lives while you're trapped in endless night. News from the outside world seems increasingly irrelevant. Political crises, celebrity scandals, sports results, they belong to a different universe. Every Antarctic station has contingency plans for catastrophic failures, but the plans themselves acknowledge a brutal truth. When things go wrong in winter, you're on your own. The medical emergency scenarios are nightmare fuel. Appendicitis strikes someone in May. The doctor has never performed an appendectomy. There's no evacuation possible for three months. The choice is attempt surgery with whoever can hold their hand steady enough to assist or watch the patient die. In 1961, Soviet doctor Leonid Rogozov performed an appendectomy on himself at Novosibirsk station because he was the only physician there. More recently, doctors have had to treat everything from severe burns to psychotic breaks with no possibility of evacuation. The medical supplies include surgical equipment, anesthetics, and instruction manuals for procedures the doctor hopes never to attempt. 
Heating system failure represents another category of potential catastrophe. At minus 60 degrees outside, indoor temperatures would plummet to lethal levels within hours if heating stopped. Backup generators stand ready, but they too can fail. Stations maintain emergency heating units powered by separate fuel supplies. Crew members know the location of every emergency shelter, every backup heat source, every survival cache. The fire scenario is equally terrifying. In the dry Antarctic air, fires spread rapidly, but using water for suppression when it's minus 60 outside creates its own problems. The water freezes instantly, creating ice hazards while failing to extinguish flames. Stations use specialized chemical suppression systems that won't freeze. Every crew member trains on fire response. A fire in June means fighting it yourself or dying. Mechanical failures cascade in extreme cold. A small leak in a fuel line becomes a major spill as diesel turns to slush. A failed bearing in a generator destroys the entire engine before anyone notices the unusual vibration. Electronic components rated for normal temperatures simply stop working. Lubricants turn to paste, seals crack. Metal becomes brittle and snaps under normal loads. Food contamination or loss could doom a crew months before rescue arrives. If the freezers fail and backup food supplies spoil, there's no grocery store to visit. Stations maintain emergency rations, enough calories to survive but not thrive. The psychological impact of food scarcity compounds other stressors. Hungry people make poor decisions. Conflicts escalate. Morale collapses. Communication system failure means complete isolation. If the satellite uplink fails, the station can't call for help even when rescue becomes possible in spring. Weather data can't be transmitted. Scientific observations are lost. More critically, crew members lose their psychological lifeline to the outside world. The inability to contact family during a six-month isolation can trigger severe psychological crisis. The human breaking points are less dramatic, but equally dangerous. A crew member develops severe depression and stops eating. Another experiences a psychotic break and becomes violent. Someone simply gives up, stops working, stops socializing, stops maintaining basic hygiene. In the confined space of a winter station, one person's psychological collapse affects everyone. Station leaders train for these scenarios, but acknowledge the limitations. You can't force someone to take psychiatric medication. Physical restraint in a small crew destroys trust, essential for survival. Isolation within isolation. Confining someone to quarters might be necessary but could worsen their condition. Every intervention risks making things worse. The last plane of summer arrives in August, bringing fresh faces, mail from home, and the first fresh vegetables in six months. The winter crew prepares to leave, but they're not the same people who watched that last plane depart in February. They've survived one of Earth's most hostile environments, not through individual heroism, but through collective determination, redundant systems, and the remarkable ability of humans to adapt to the impossible. When the winter crew finally boards that August plane, they carry with them a knowledge that can't be taught, only lived. They know what it means to depend absolutely on others and be absolutely depended upon in return. They know what their minds and bodies can endure. They know what matters when everything else is stripped away. Heat, food, water, light, and the presence of other humans maintaining the thin envelope of civilization against the void. As our species prepares for longer journeys into space, for settlements on other worlds, for challenges we can't yet imagine, the lessons from Antarctic winter crews become increasingly valuable. Not the technical lessons about generators and insulation, though those matter. The deeper lessons about how humans survive together when survival alone is impossible. In the end, that might be the most important data transmitted from those isolated stations through their limited satellite bandwidth. Proof that wherever humans go, however hostile the environment, we can create small warm spaces where life continues, where work gets done where people take care of each other, and where even in the deepest darkness, humans find reasons to celebrate being alive.